This is Our View, brought to you by the proud members of the Washington Federation of State Employees, your neighbors. Every edition of Our View has always ended with a labor history feature with Ross Reeder. This month, an exception. Ross is first as he brings us a message from the Coalition of Union Workers at the Boeing Company. I promise you, dear viewers, this is my final word on the Boeing affair of late 2013, at least for the time being. I'm sure Boeing is the biggest corporation in our state. I'm sure it has the most trained and experienced workers with the longest amount of experience in building successful flying machines. And it is the most disappointing example of the morals of American corporations. Today I'm quoting directly from a statement from the Coalition of Labor Unions at uh, Boeing Club, representing more than 60,000 skilled and experienced employees at the Boeing Company. The Coalition of Labor Unions at Boeing assures airplane customers, investors, and the flying public we are ready that they are ready to meet the challenge of designing, manufacturing the 77X on time, within budget and without growing pains. Every successful Boeing commercial aircraft was designed, engineered, manufactured, protected, delivered by our members. From the Teamsters who transport the parts, SPIA members who design, engineer, and deliver aircraft, machinists who skillfully manufacture the planes, operating engineers who maintain our facilities, industrial firefighters who protect our plants and security guards who protect the people and our trade secrets. Unions representing Boeing employees in Washington State and other legacy locations are the proven path to success. Our members are ready to answer the demand of airplane customers at the recent Dubai Air Show to rein in control of processes and renew focus on building the highest quality, safest, and most reliable aircraft in the world. Boeing has the infrastructure, our members have the training and experience. Together, we can put the anxiety of aerospace customers to rest for good. The Boeing reputation, along with the success of our company, and our communities, and our aerospace customers depend on making the right choice for the 777X, the Coalition of Labor Unions at Boeing. It's a clear choice, the right choice to meet that challenge. The history of worker safety in the Bangladesh garment industry is atrocious to say the least. Hundreds have died in working conditions not fit for a human being, all in the name of fashion and cheap t-shirts. Internationally, trade unionists are standing up for those workers and have created the Bangladesh Accord, signed by the retailers who have their products made there. It's a step forward. So Uni's been working with Industrial to negotiate and implement what's called the Accord for Worker Safety in Bangladesh, the Accord for Fire and Building Safety in Bangladesh. Um, and under that agreement, which is a transformation in the supply chain relationships in Bangladesh, the about almost 100, about 90 something brands and retailers have made a binding commitment that we will inspect factories, provide resources to repair them and stay in the market to make it a better and safer place. Um, and we will also train and engage trade unions in this process, which hopefully creates a platform from which we can have some real worker organizing in the, in the garment industry. So we have a huge number of um, European brands and then some from other parts of the world. Um, so we have incredible buy-in from the brands. I think they realize that the old model really doesn't work anymore. The old voluntary model where they do everything on their own. And you might have 10 inspections of the same factory, but no real effort to make it better. Um, and chaos, you know, on the ground, it just didn't, it has not worked. It's a failure. So we have incredible buy-in from brands. Our accord now comes covers 1,600 factories employing about 2 million workers in Bangladesh, which is almost one half of the export market in Bangladesh is now covered by the Accord. So we have a lot of traction, a significant base upon which to make real improvements. So now, does the American consumer have confidence they're buying clothing made in conditions safe for the workers in Bangladesh? You can't really have that confidence. I would say um, the best thing to do is look on the Bangladesh 
accord.org website and see what brands have signed the accord and stick with those brands. Now, that's still, you know, I mean, that, that would be the, what I would recommend. Um, and of course, there's lots of brands that are sold in the U.S., H&M, Zara Inditex, um, many more, PVH, which is Philip Hoiser, uh, I think Ralph Lauren is signatory also, is part of uh, PVH, that are committed to the accord. So I think, you know, that's what I would recommend. I mean, we're not um, specifically putting any tag on products that say made in safe conditions, um, but, but, you know, stick with the signatory brands. Our conversation with David Cohen continues this month as he sees signs within the community of recent immigrants who are starting to organize themselves and may give a needed boost to the country's labor movement. I'm very encouraged by what's happening. I think, first of all, the Latin and South Asian influence in this country has created a, a spirit of popular education. Uh, popular education means critical thinking and it means finding ways of, of actually learning from your own experience in a reflective way. And so you have the creation of institutions such as worker service centers, uh, which you find all over the country now. There are about 225 of them. And in my Washington area, La Casa is a major place, and it not only brings in uh, Latin uh, uh, workers, uh, but they have created room for African Americans um, and, and Asian Americans, and there's an emphasis on popular education, um, uh, establishing what their own interests are so that the gardeners will not uh, do work for less than a certain amount an hour, which is above the minimum wage and that begins to create solidarity and community. And, um, and there's also at the same time an emphasis on teaching English so that there's a recognition that to really function fully in, in an American society, in a U.S. society, you do have to know English. You have to know how to speak it, you have to know how to write it, you have to know how to read it. And there is that, that, that emphasis. In no way does that diminish cultural heritage or the use of language with older people. Um, uh, I know in my own experience, I'm the son of actually illegal immigrants. And, and my parents spoke Yiddish to each other, but they always spoke English to me because they wanted me to be part of America and to, and to use English. And so we begin to see this in these worker service centers. And that's a wonderful way of organizing that I think labor movement, labor organizations can learn from. And the fact that Richard Trumpke, has re as the head of the AFL-CIO, has recognized uh, that the AFL-CIO has to go outside of its institution to begin to establish and solidify and build worker strength is a very encouraging sign. We have a lot to learn from the day laborers who have created their own organization around the country and provide outlets for cultural expression, uh, for recreation such as soccer or um, uh, girls basketball or women's soccer and, and have become a gathering place for people to uh, begin to assert their rights uh, as human beings and, and live a life of dignity and begin to create their own opportunities. This message of revitalizing the labor movement has not been missed on the AFL-CIO. In the recent convention, they addressed the need to reach beyond their own membership and represent all those who work. The whole focus of trying to rejuvenate the, the trade union movement, not just in, in the United States, but, but more globally, has to be focused around um, not just representing small groups of workers. I think if the, if the critical mass of, of organizing drops, as it has done in some countries, we estimate globally maybe only 8% of the global labor force is now actually in unions, then uh, the real uh, the real risk is that it'll be very hard to, to, to keep that and maintain that and develop union, union strength. 
So I think it's absolutely essential, and this was reflected in the FLCO Convention, that there's a kind of outreach policy to try to bring those groups of workers who require union protection, would support unions, but may not have the specific type of employment relationship which would allow traditional ways of organising to work, to bring them into the union movement in, in different ways. The US is obviously different in that you have a legal structure which is focused very much upon um, uh, recognition rights of, of unions with a very high bar to get on the question of recognition for collective bargaining. So I think as a moving to ultimately strong uh, collective bargaining relationships, there's a range of different ways in which workers can get represented. So the message I took it from that that was about organising, it's about certainly bringing groups such as um, workers uh, in a precarious situation without full protection, uh, immigrant workers, workers in fast food chains, young people who are really being exploited in the labour force. Uh, to bring them into a relationship with unions which show, shows what, can, uh, what unions can do to support them. And I think that's certainly an important, uh, important one important part of a strand uh, for, for rejuvenating the union movement in the future. I think um, listening to, to the discussions in California, it's clear there's a tradition of community organising which, uh, of which unions are part, but which go beyond unions. So the, the focus, I think, of reaching out to some of those community groups uh, was also an important part of the message coming out, uh, out of the FLCO Convention. Our agenda is America's agenda. The American people know that the system is rigged against them and they want us to level the playing field. That's our mandate. That's what we're here to do. That's right. Now, I've already fought and lost my share of battles in Washington. And I've been around long enough to know Washington is a tough place. Real reform isn't easy. But I also know this. If we don't fight, we can't win. But if we fight, we will win. The budget, immigration, minimum wage, uphill battles, you bet. But however tough the challenge, however steep our climb, I am proud to stand with you, to march with you, to fight side by side with you. Our agenda is America's agenda. Let me hear it. Our agenda is America's agenda. And if we fight for it, we win. We win. We'll do this. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been Our View, brought to you by the members of the Washington Federation of State Employees. We remind you, when you accept a paycheck for your hard work, you don't give up your rights. Thank you for watching. Where is the middle class gone? We're more productive, but we take home less money. For all the hours we've worked, we're just not seeing it in our paychecks. Yet our cost of food, housing, clothing, transportation, and health care just keep getting more expensive. Meanwhile, all the income gains of the last 15 years went to the richest 10% of Americans. And the minimum wage? stagnant. Workers are trying to squeeze by on only $15,000 a year. This inequality simply weakens our economy and prevents our middle class from growing. It hurts our families. It's unsustainable. It's time to close the gap. Raising the minimum wage is the right place to start.